Well, we've been traveling all around the world lately, and it's been real exciting. I just got back from China and the Philippines, and, and uh, was heading out to South Africa with Tom Bauer, who is our regional director for the South Pacific. But he somehow thinks that South Africa is in the South Pacific, but he, uh, he was on his way over there, and I ended up in Israel instead. And everywhere I have gone in the world, I have seen a tremendous amount of awareness, not just in the eyes of the Christian beholder of what, how to discern orthodoxy, but I have seen it in the Mormon people themselves. And I see a great awakening take place. We were down in Tonga a year ago. Tonga is a little tiny island country. Uh, there's about 160 islands are down by Fiji and, and Samoa out toward New Zealand. And we went down there about a year ago, March and we showed the temple of the God Makers all through the islands, and it was an exciting time. Uh, we, we saw a tremendous change. Uh, Tom Bauer, who again was with me, he and I went in to see the, the heads of the Mormon church in Tonga, the two regional representatives of the South Pacific. There was one there from, from Hawaii who was going to each island about a couple of days ahead of us. Everywhere we went, he was there. And also the regional representative for the South Pacific out of Tonga. And we went into their offices and I told them that we had come because we had recognized that there are two kinds of leaders in the world, religious leaders. They are the righteous leaders and the unrighteous leaders. And we told them that a righteous leader is one who leads their people to an understanding of the true God of the Bible and surrenders themselves to that God and lives those kinds of love laws that this God has given us. And an unrighteous leader is one who will lead their people to a false God and a false system, and a false Christ. And we told them that we believe that they were unrighteous religious leaders. And I asked them to repent. And they didn't say flee, they didn't say get out. The Tongan regional representative said, we can't. We can't repent. And then we said, then we must do what we must do. We must reveal the truth of Mormonism to the people of Tonga. Now why is Tonga important? It's important because two things. Number one, it was basically a Christian nation of the Wesleyan Methodist Church. They came in and, and, and proselytized for Jesus Christ. And there was great revival in the 1800s, a great revival that swept across the whole South Pacific and brought Christianity to the whole South Pacific. And right behind that came Mormonism. And so we told them that we'd have to reveal the truth of Mormonism to the people. Mormonism claims that Tonga is the largest per capita nation of Mormonism in the entire world, having approximately 30% of the population. 110,000 people live in Tonga, and they claim 30,000 of them are Mormons. The king of Tonga, while we were there, although he had already been a Christian, rededicated and made a very strong position for himself for Jesus Christ. And he claimed Jesus Christ, king of Tonga, king of kings and lord of lords. He issued a declaration, he issued a declaration to his people and told them to repent of their sins and, re and restore themselves to Jesus Christ. And he made a special effort to tell the Mormon people that they were in sin and following a false prophet, a false scripture, and a false Jesus Christ, and told them to leave Mormonism and restore themselves to Jesus Christ. And from 30,000 Mormons today, we estimate only 1,000 Mormons are left in the Mormon church in Tonga. Mormon church, the Mormon church is, is losing, his leases are expiring in Tonga because uh, Palangi, somebody outside of Tonga cannot own land in Tonga. And they are not renewing the leases. The last lease was a 12-year school and a ward building, and when the Mormons could not have their lease renewed, they told the, the noble who owned the land that this was a place to worship God according to the authority and they bulldozed the place to the ground rather than let the people have the, light, the, the property back in, in, in the condition that they improved it. And all the South Pacific watches, they bulldozed down that property. And so the, the handwriting is on the wall there. The handwriting is on the wall in East Germany. Already they put a temple up in East Germany. I saw it on television today. But God is already ahead there because the missionaries can't even go in there to proselytize. And I believe that everywhere we've seen, down in South America, in Chile, in Brazil, where Walter Martin has a work going on right now, where Walter and Martin and I went down and preached to and, and taught to tens of thousands of Christian leaders, to, to uh, Colombia, to Mexico City, to England, to, to every, every part of the world, to South Africa. 
We're seeing people who are saying it's no longer a, a Christian responsibility to lay there and be stepped on. Jesus didn't do it. The apostles didn't do it. And it's time for us as Christians to stand firm and say, we will not be moved from the truth. Amen. You know, I just had some words with one of my sons. It was very hard words that we had, but it was a lesson of responsibility and something that had to be taken care of. And I'm not going to go into my personal family situations here tonight, but I had to have hard words with my son. My son was a grown man, was having tears as he and I spoke on the phone last night. But I had to speak those words to my son even though they hurt me inside because I know that it requires my son to come up and stand up and be responsible for certain things in his life. He has to know. And even though they were hard and hurting words that I had to share with my son, and I have four sons, so nobody guess which one I was talking to, but, but as I talked to him last night, I knew those were hard words, but I knew that he was going to grow from it and that it was going to mature him and that he was going to, it was going to be an important thing in his life. The same way I've shared with my Mormon friends and loved ones the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I have to tell them what it's like so they know what it's like. The entire world is aware of what's going on. Tom just got back from South Africa. There are hundreds and hundreds of copies of the film The Godmakers all through Africa right now. Mormonism doesn't stand a chance in Africa because if the truth is there, you can't play games. And if you're bold enough to speak the truth, even though it may offend a friend or a loved one, it's the end result. I look back at being a Mormon and hating Dr. Walter Martin. I was a man that I could really dislike. I could, I could go on for 15 minutes and tell you about the many things I disliked about him. Most of those I've forgotten in th these days since I became a Christian. Actually, what has happened is that my hate for him and my hate for a girl named Ann Dull, who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with my wife to the point that I wanted, I could have killed her, literally. I hated that woman so much that if I could have gotten away with it, I would have killed her. I mean, that much hate poured out of my heart against that woman. Vicious, bitter hate. But the night that I got on my knees in a little church in my neighborhood and I gave my life to Jesus Christ, when I surrendered my soul to him and I confessed my sin and I told him that I didn't think I was going to become a god, I didn't think I had any of the qualifications, I thought there was only one god and the job was taken, I told him that, that I was a sinner of the worst kind. Not only was I the run-of-the-mill sinner, but I was also a man who believed in self-exaltation, which is a curse in the Word of God. In Isaiah 14, where we hear that, that Lucifer himself was cast down because of his desire to lift up his own throne. And that was what I was involved in. And I gave my life to Jesus, got up off my knees that night, knew I was set free from the guilt of my sin, and felt tons of dark things come off my shoulders as I stood up, redeemed, knowing I'd be with Jesus. From that time on until this day, you know, Ann Dull, I loved. The minute I looked in her eyes and knew the look that I saw it wasn't an attack on me, but it was the love of Jesus Christ. And for the moment that I laid eyes physically on Walter Martin, I knew this is a man of God. Now I came here tonight not to speak. I came here tonight to learn. I came here tonight to hear what this man of God has to say. I know that my life is better for it from hearing these things of him. I know many of you here today are Christians because you didn't like him, but you listened to him. <laughs> but I love him, and I'm going to listen to him tonight, and I hope you enjoy it and learn as much as I will tonight. So God bless you very much. Amen. All right, it's my pleasure to bring to you Dr. Walter Martin, who has a pedigree longer than I can ever name. He's the Bible Answer Man all across the nation on live radio. He is considered the world's foremost authority on the cults and the occult, and he's one of the world's foremost theologians. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you right now Dr. Walter Martin.
Thank you very much. It's a real joy, I can't tell you how great a joy, to be here with you among so many friends and to see the great enthusiasm and interest in the Word of God. I'd like to begin this evening by saying that if you came to the lecture expecting roast Mormon for dinner, you will be very disappointed because the name of the game is evangelism. The name of the game is the gospel. And the name of the game is to every man an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within you with humility and with reverence. It's great to be with Ed Decker and to be sponsored by Saints Alive and Ex-Mormons for Jesus, to realize that there are so many people who have come from Mormonism into the great love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tonight, I'm going to be speaking on Mormonism. Is it Christianity? The differences that persist between historic Christianity and the Mormon church. Before I begin, I'd like very much to bow before the Lord in a word of prayer, and then to go to the scriptures. How many have your Bibles? Mm, good thinking. Let's pray before the Lord. <laughs> Almighty God, our Father, author of everlasting life, Savior of the world in Jesus Christ, we worship Thee. And we consecrate this meeting to Thee and ask that the power of Thy Holy Spirit may be here, that Thou will fall upon the minds of every person gathered here, upon those who are Mormons, Lord. Open the eyes and ears of the mind and soul that they may see only Thee and hear only Thy voice. Strengthen and bless thy people, and sanctify us through thy truth, Father. Thy word is truth. Protect us from the wicked one. Bind the forces of darkness. Glorify thy son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to look at a couple of verses from the word of God, which I think are tremendously important for our study this evening. The first is found in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives to you a sign or a miracle and the sign or the miracle comes to pass whereof he spake unto thee and he says let us go after other gods which thou hast not known let us serve them thou shalt not listen unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God. You shall fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and you shall cling to him. Notice verse 5. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be executed because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to thrust you out of the way which the Lord your God commanded you to walk in, so shall you put this evil away from the midst of you. The purpose of the false prophet, verse 5, is always to turn you away from the Lord your God. The goal of the false prophet, to thrust you out of the way which the Lord your God commanded you to walk in. And then the second passage parallel to this is found in the New Testament. In the Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 1, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but which definitely should be read again, because its applicability is obvious. Verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ, to another gospel, which is not another. There be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, but though we are an angel out of heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, I say it again. If anyone preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. The Greek word which is used twice by the apostle here, anathema, means under the divine damnation. If anybody comes, even the apostles themselves, 
and they give you another gospel than the one which was originally given to the church, then you are to count that person, even if the person were the Apostle Paul himself, under divine damnation. Mormonism is the only cult indigenous to the United States which began essentially with an angelic revelation. The angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith, Jr., he said, in 1823 in Palmyra, New York, told him to dig in the hill Cumorah, and the rest is history. The discovery of the golden plates, the translation of the reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics through the use of the Arab and the Thummim, and then finally the founding of the Mormon Church in 1830. The claim of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints is an enormous claim. They are not Protestant, they are not Catholic. They are the only true restored gospel of Christ on the face of the earth. So if we are to understand Mormonism, there's only one way to possibly find out if they're telling the truth. And that's not by asking for a burning in your bosom because that could be indigestion. <laughs> and it's certainly not by praying about it if God has already told you something. You do not have to pray about something God already told you. If God said, thou shalt not kill, and you get a chance to kill somebody and get away with it, you do not pray about that and say, can I do it this time? <laughs> if God said, don't do it, you don't do it. And you don't pray about it to find out whether you do it. So when we have the word of God to instruct us as to what we are to do, it's not necessary to pray about a specific thing. Now, there are some ground rules that I would like to observe before I begin to speak this evening. The first ground rule is that Mormons who attend this meeting and many lectures I have delivered across the earth say, where do you get your authority to criticize other people's religions and particularly the Mormon church? Why don't you just practice the Baptist religion and leave everybody else alone? Answer, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. To as many as received him, Jesus Christ gave the authority to become the sons of God. My authority comes not from the Aaronic priesthood or from the Melchizedek priesthood. It does not come from John the Baptist or Peter, James, and John. It comes personally from Jesus Christ who outranks all of them because he created them. The first rule of thumb is the Christian church's authority rests squarely upon the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, Brigham Young gives me authority. I quote him since I stand in the city named for him. Quote, take up the Bible. There it is. Compare the religion of the Latter-day Saints with it. We will. And see if it will stand the test. Close quote. Brigham Young gave me authority to take up the Bible, to compare the religion of Mormonism with it, and to see if it would stand the test. Not only did Brigham Young give me that authority, but in the classic Mormon publication by Orson Pratt, one of the apostles of the church, he gave me authority. I quote, Convince us of our errors of doctrine, if we have any, by reason, by logical argument, or by the word of God and we will be ever grateful for the information, and you will ever have the pleasing reflection that you have been instruments in the hands of God of redeeming your fellow beings from the darkness which you may see enveloping their minds. Close quote. Convince us by reason, by logical arguments, or by the word of God of our errors of doctrine if we have any, and we will be grateful to you. So, my authority comes first of all from the highest of all authorities, Jesus Christ. It comes secondly from Brigham Young, successor to Joseph Smith. It comes from Orson Pratt and a standard Mormon publication, The Seer. So that's my authority. I did not take it upon myself. It was bestowed upon me. Secondly, often there are questions about my qualifications that spring up in Mormon circles. Here in uh, Salt Lake City, there's a gentleman going around the landscape announcing that he worked with Walter Martin 
He was a member of my staff. He knows me personally. He's a liar. Got it straight? L-I-A-R. He doesn't know me personally. He never worked with me. He never taught with me. He never preached with me. He's a phony. Got it? So the next time you hear it, remember what I told you. It's not true. He says he's out to destroy Walter Martin. Rot's a rock. <laughs> because the scripture says, no weapon formed against thee will prosper and every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you will judge. That is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord, and it comes from me, says the Lord. <laughs> it has also been bandied about, and I just answered it on national radio, that there's some question about my educational background. May I draw to the attention of the Mormons that they will look in the Dictionary of International Biography, who's who in religion, who's who in the West, and about 16 other reference works, they will find out that I have been thoroughly examined by the secular and the religious world, and my credentials are perfectly in order. Every bit as much as any professor from Brigham Young University. <laughs> Finally, I am accused constantly of misrepresentation. Walter Martin misrepresents us. Walter Martin quotes us out of context. That's not an accurate quotation by Walter Martin. Now, listen very carefully so you may repeat this to your Mormon friends. Walter Martin is on record as offering to provide to any bona fide Mormon or Mormon scholar any of the documents which I quoted and researched in the archives of the Mormon Church, Stanford University, or the Berrien Collection in New York City, the most extensive collections on Mormonism in the world. Perfectly content to give them chapter and verse page and photo copy, and I have offered that for 30 years. To this date, I have never had a taker. Because I have a requirement with it. If I produce all the evidence, and if I prove everything that I say, you leave the Mormon church. And if I'm not telling the truth, then it's very easy to refute it. Finally, just to clear the air forever on the subject. In 1957, I wrote a pamphlet on Mormonism, the first that had been published in this country in almost 50 years. I followed it up with a book entitled The Maze of Mormonism. And in that book, The Maze of Mormonism, drawing upon sources which I dug up over a nine-year period in various libraries scattered around the world, I made the following charges. I said that Joseph Smith, Jr. was a glass looker, a peep stone gazer, and a fortune teller. I said that Joseph Smith was convicted of this and fined. I said that Joseph Smith had given copies of the characters of reformed Egyptian to Martin Harris, and that Martin Harris had taken them to Professor Charles Anthon of Columbia University, and that Charles Anthon had pronounced them a fraud. I made all of those accusations with documentary material based upon 19th century materials and research in the year 1962, 23 years before the publication in the Los Angeles Times and a Newsweek magazine which confirmed exactly what I had said then, chapter and verse. So let us not bandy about misrepresentation, facts, evidence, or materials. Newsweek magazine dealt the death blow to this kind of nonsense just recently when it said, coincidentally, money digging is the subject of a second controversial Mormon letter that surfaced last week. The missive written by Smith in 1825 was released by Gordon Hinckley, acting president of the Latter-day Saints, who had previously denied the church ownership of the document. They denied they had it when they knew they had it. Newsweek picked that up. And they have a record of suppressing evidence and facts that simply will not quit. No longer can we rely upon the angel Moroni because earliest documents have revealed that the actual name was Nephi. 
And no longer can we worry about whether it was an angel or not. Leaping lizards, it was a salamander. <laughs> so from the people who spent their lives manufacturing myths about Joseph Smith and about early Mormonism, they are hardly in a position to point their finger at me or any other scholar who brings out facts concerning the Mormon religion. It is also stated, Walter Martin is an anti-Mormon. Ed Decker is an anti-Mormon, and you want to read anti-Mormon literature. Let me address that very quickly by pointing this out. I am anti-communist, vigorously and historically. I hate the philosophy of communism, but I do not hate communists. I am against their philosophy. I am not against them. I love Mormons. I hate Mormon theology that contradicts the Bible. Yeah. Finally, it is not anti-Mormon to publish truth. Newsweek magazine is hardly anti-Mormon. It published the truth. Los Angeles Times is hardly anti-Mormon. It published the truth. So let's not talk about being anti-Mormon when you print the truth. Because the Mormon church has been printing all kinds of things about the Christian church for years. And they don't consider themselves to be anti-Christian. Now, I realize you could go on quoting materials and information. One of the great myths that's propagated by Mormon missionaries and by Mormonism today is that the Christian church attacked Mormonism and persecuted the Mormons. We better go back and get our history straight. Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, and Joseph Smith was governing in Nauvoo, and Joseph Smith was proclaiming himself to be a ruler over the Mormon people and a general and was using his activities and offices in such a way, including the printing of funds which were not legal, that it was necessary for him to be incarcerated. He was murdered, and that was a great evil and a great sin. But let it not be forgotten that it was Joseph Smith who said, all of the religions of Christendom were wrong, all of the creeds of Christendom were an abomination to God, and all of the professors of Christendom were corrupt. So the first attack was launched by Joseph Smith against the Christian church. It was followed up by Sidney Rigdon's famous Salt Sermon, in which he maintained the Christian churches were totally bereft of any flavoring as salt and should be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. For his troubles, Sidney and Joseph were tarred and feathered and ridden out of, tone, of town on a rail because the Baptists, apparently, in that part of the country took a dim view of uh, being criticized. <laughs> Again, it's the Mormon missionary who comes into your living room today that attacks all religions. We are constantly told that we will not stand up in public meetings and debate Walter Martin on the air, television, radio, or anywhere else. I've got those statements. Because we don't believe in confrontation. Really? That's interesting. Every Mormon mission I ever talked to was taught to confront people at Salt Lake City's training center. Isn't that right? You're supposed to knock on the door, smile, shake the hand firmly, call the person brother or sister, and then tell them you represent the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, and you come in and you give them a presentation which attacks everything that they believe, replaces their entire religion, and says in effect, and I quote here, that the Protestant and Catholic churches, this is Orson Pratt, are the great whore of Babylon. That's from the book of Revelation. The great whore of Babylon is to be destroyed by the wrath of God. So let's get the record straight. It wasn't Christianity that came after Mormonism. It was Mormonism that attacked Christianity, and it is Christianity's response to Mormonism, which they call anti-Mormon. The Bible says,
Give to everyone that asks of you an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within you with humility and reverence to every man, an answer. And if you can't give an answer, there's something wrong with your Christian faith. The reason why Mormonism is wrong is because the people that are drawn into it are people who are uninformed on their Bibles. They do not have a good knowledge of the Word of God. I never met a person yet that was a good biblical scholar that ever became a member of the Mormon Church or ever became a member of any cult. Because when you know your Bible, you're not going to get in it. Two Mormon missionaries came to me not long ago before they found out who I was. <laughs> and they said, why are Christians so hostile to us? I mean, all we're doing is going out and propagating our faith. We don't object to you propagating yours. You shouldn't object to our propagating ours. I said, I don't object to your propagating your faith at all. I said, you can go out and hand out tracts and knock on doors and do anything you want. I said, that's freedom of religion in the United States. I want it for myself. I want you to have it. I'll fight for your right to have it. We should all be free to have our own rights. But I said, it's a different thing when you go into the living room of my parishioners, when you go into the homes of Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Catholics, or anybody else, and then you proceed to tear down everything that they believe by telling them that you are replacing it with the restored gospel. That's confrontation, and that's attacking us. And we have a right to defend ourselves. I am not... I'm not attacking Mormons. I'm defending Christianity against Mormonism. And that's the task of all Christians. And if you don't do it, then you'll see the multiplication of cults on a greater scale than you have ever seen before. I said to these young Mormons, look, let me give you an illustration. I said, I'll explain to you in the simplest possible terms why the Christian church gets angry at you and upset with you over what you do. And they said, okay. And they took notes on it. They said, supposing somebody knocked on your door and said, we are representative of the American government and we are dedicated, loyal Americans. Look, we carry a copy of the Constitution. We have a flag with us. And they use all of the vocabulary of an American. And then, as they're talking, you begin to notice that some of the words seem to mean different things. And so you start asking them questions. And you say to these two young men, you're Americans? Yes. You're loyal to the Constitution? Yes. Do you believe in freedom of speech? And they say, well, now, of course, that depends on how you define freedom of speech. <laughs> he said, do you believe in freedom of religion? And they say, well, of course, that means on whose religion you're talking about. He said, wait a minute. Do you believe in the Bill of Rights? Well, yes. Then you believe in freedom of the press, don't you? Well, only if the press prints the truth. All of a sudden, it begins to dawn on you, no matter how dumb you are, that no matter how much they look like Americans and sound like Americans, wave the flag like Americans, have a copy of the Constitution like Americans, and use the vocabulary of democracy, you are not dealing with loyal Americans. You are dealing with counterfeits. I think they got the message because I said, you knock on our doors and you say, we are Christians. You bring out the Bible and you talk about Jesus Christ and salvation and you use Christian terms. And then you produce the Book of Mormon. Doctrine and Covenants, Pro of Great Price. And you say this is a new revelation which is amended to the old one. Just like the guy that knocks on the door who comes out with a list of things and says, well, we have some amendments to the Constitution. You know you're not dealing 
with a true American. Neither are you dealing with a true Christian. Because the language of Christianity doesn't save you. Being a nice guy or gal doesn't save you. Being moral, upright, thrifty, hardworking, and a good neighbor doesn't save you. What saves you is whether or not you know the genuine Jesus Christ, whether you worship the only living and true God, and whether you are in accord with the revelation given in the New Testament. That is what saves you. Mormons have four sacred books. Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, and the Bible, insofar as it is correctly translated. What does that mean? That means that wherever the Bible contradicts Mormon theology, the translation can't be right. The quickest way to deal with the Mormon when he says that to you is to say lovingly, do you read Greek and Hebrew? And the Mormon missionary, who can, has difficulty many times with English, never mind Greek and Hebrew, is going to say to you, um, no. Well, the translators of the Bible could read Greek and Hebrew very well. Now, you go read the Greek and Hebrew, then you come back and tell me what it says. Until then, that's an accurate translation. You can't read it, you don't know anything about it. So don't tell me it's not correctly translated. Because you can't read the language. And of course, if you're going to deal with Mormon theology and with Mormonism, you must have learned this by now, living in Mormon country. The oldest book of the Mormons, four sacred books, is the Bible. It's the oldest book. The Mormons say that all of those books came from God. Then if God is to be believed, then if he's consistent and if he tells the truth, he's not going to contradict himself and he's not going to lie because he says so. God is not a man that he should lie. Paul says it is impossible for God to lie. It is against his nature to lie. And Malachi 3, 6 says, I, the Lord thy God, I do not change. The unalterable, unchanging God. The Bible tests the Mormon sacred books. It tests Pearl of Great Price. It tests Doctrine and Covenants. It tests the Book of Mormon. Because the Bible is the oldest revelation, and Jude verse 3 is a verse you should memorize. When I wrote to you concerning the common salvation, it was necessary for me to urge you, put up a good fight for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. The faith was given to the Christian church by the close of the first century of the Christian era. Nothing was to be added to it, nothing was to be taken away. Add not to his word, lest he reprove you, and you be found a liar. The word of God is inviolate. The Mormon missionaries often say, you mean to say that God couldn't have talked to Joseph Smith if he wanted to? He couldn't have given him revelations? He couldn't have told him things that we don't have in our Bible? Answer, God could have told Joseph Smith anything God wanted to tell him. And he can tell anybody else anything he wants to tell them. But there's one way that we can know if it's God talking and not man or the devil. You test what is said by what you know God already said. And when you do that, you find out that Joseph was not telling the truth. He was adding to the word of God. Often Mormon missionaries will say to me, but Mormons are good people. They're thrifty, they're nice neighbors, they're sincere, they're zealous, they work hard. They really believe in what they're doing. And look at the works of Mormonism. Look at the things that are going on in Mormonism. How can you say that Mormonism is not a Christian church? I always turn to the Mormon and I say to them, what do you think of the Jehovah's Witnesses? And the Mormon says, they're a cult. 
Right? They're a cult. Goodness. The Jehovah's Witnesses are thrifty, good people, nice neighbors, sincere, zealous, dedicated, and they out-evangelize the Mormons. They print more material than the Mormons print. They make more calls on people's houses than the Mormons do. The Jehovah's Witnesses are 15 times more effective evangelically than the Mormons are. The Jehovah's Witnesses are hardworking and they've been in existence a shorter time than the Mormons. Why aren't the Jehovah's Witnesses the Church of Jesus Christ? They have the same qualifications. The Mormons is because they're a cult. <laughs> and yet the Mormons get mad at me when I say Mormonism is a non-Christian cult. Why is everybody so afraid of the word cult? Look it up in the dictionary. Cultas. It means a group of people. In this case, a group of people gathered around somebody's interpretation of the Bible. In the case of Mormonism, it's Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. In the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, Russell and Rutherford and the Watchtower Society. In the case of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy. In the case of Unity, the Fillmores. A cult, a non-Christian cult, is a group of people polarized about somebody's interpretation of the Bible that always claims to agree with Christianity, but always ends up denying the central doctrines of the Christian faith. All cults, including Mormonism, deny the biblical doctrine of God, deny the doctrine of the Trinity, deny the eternal deity of Jesus Christ, deny his virgin birth, and deny the fact that his blood shed on the cross pays finally for all sin. They deny salvation by grace and justification by faith. And they are excluded from the Christian church because of their denial of the centrality of the Christian message, not because they're nice people. Let's understand something. I have no quarrel with the convictions of Mormons. They are perfectly at liberty to believe what they wish. They are not at liberty to knock on doors, enter living rooms, and attack the Church of Jesus Christ and expect us to sit there and do nothing. For years, the Southern Baptist Convention, to which I belong and am a minister in, and is the largest Protestant denomination in the world, approaching 15 million members, three times the size of the Mormon Church. And if we keep growing at our present rate, by 1990, there will be more Baptists than people. <laughs> For years, I would tell my Southern Baptist friends and ministers and colleagues, Look out for Mormonism. It looks like us, it acts like us, it sounds like us, they dress like us. It's a perfect counterfeit. We've got to be aware of what's going on. You know, for years, my Southern Baptist brother said to me, Walter, I know you're very zealous in this area, but don't become an alarmist. You'll lose your credibility. And then, two years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention woke up. And in Texas, the Mormons were making inroads on, of all things, the Southern Baptist Church. Immediately, like a wounded bull elephant, the Baptists came to life. And they suddenly realized, hey, this is dangerous stuff. And I began to get telephone calls. Hey, what do we do about this? I mean, this is a cult. Where do we go from here? Well, I want to serve notice on the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. The Southern Baptist Convention is awake and alive, uh, and we are about ready to start evangelism of our own and telling people all over the country and the world that the Southern Baptist denomination stands against the Mormon Church and stands against it as a non-Christian cult. That's the first major denomination to do that. If they think we were weak and disorganized before, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because they have awakened. Finally, 
two more missionaries followed me in their car one day when I was taking my constitutional walk. And they wanted to talk with me, and I said I had to finish my walk. So they drove along behind me until I got to where I was going. And then they got out and happened to be a Kmart parking lot. And they said, we heard your lecture last night. You certainly have done your homework. But something bothers us. And I said, all right, what is it? They said, we believe you're sincere. We think you're wrong, but we believe you're sincere. But you know, something you said disturbed us. They said, you said we were lost. And I said, no, I didn't say that. I said, the Bible said, anybody that denies that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh is lost. Anybody that denies salvation by grace alone through faith is lost. You deny it. Therefore, logically, you are lost unless you repent. These two boys looked at me for a moment, and then they said, Dr. Morton, don't you think that even if we are wrong, that God will take into consideration that we are sincere and that we have good intentions? You know how many Mormons believe that? You can't count them. They have told me across this world that even if they're wrong, God's going to let them in anyhow because they're sincere and they have good intentions. Don't you know the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Don't you know that there is such a place as hell? The Book of Mormon speaks on it, but of course most Mormons are unfamiliar with the contents of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon in unhesitating terms discusses the subject of hell. So I drew this to their attention. They were somewhat surprised. Quote, For behold, if you have procrastinated the day of your repentance until death, behold, you have become subjected to the spirit of the devil. He doth see you as his. Therefore, the spirit of the Lord has withdrawn from you and hath no place in you, and the devil hath all power over you. And this is the final state of the wicked. Alma 34, 35. Mosiah 5.5, 5. and we are willing to enter into a covenant with our God to do his will, to be obedient to his commandments in all things that he shall command us, all the remainder of our days that we may not bring upon ourselves, listen, never-ending torment, as has been spoken by the angel, that we may not drink of the cup of the wrath of God, close quote. You know where the cup of the wrath of God is? To the book of Revelation. He treadeth out the fierceness of the wine of the wrath of Almighty God. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Now, if you're a Mormon here tonight and you think good intentions are going to get you into the kingdom of God, forget it. And if you think sincerity is going to get you there, forget it. There's one thing that's going to get you there. You're going to get down on your knees and you're going to cry out to Jesus Christ and say, come into my heart and save me. And he will. The LA Times in its key quotation on Mormonism, exposing the salamander, Harris's letter, Calgary's history, made the interesting observation, quoting a young Mormon girl, realized this is the psychology behind Mormonism. Quote, some Mormons have asked rhetorically how much difference exists in the final analysis between a salamander and an angel and between magic and religion. Listen, when I said that Joseph was a peepstone gazer and a treasure hunter, 
The Mormon Church responded by saying that these were unproved allegations and there was not one word of truth in them. Now, it's not only a word of truth, it's absolute fact. They have published this court record of Joseph's conviction for what? Fortune telling and peepstone gazing. We have also found out that he did it in another county right nearby there. And they caught him again. Only this time Joseph was too smart for them. He posted bail and jumped bail. Ran away for a year and came back afterwards when the statute of limitations had lapsed. We now have Joseph Smith in the Martin Harris letter telling him how he did it. We have all of the things that were before considered unproved allegations. Now would you mind telling me what else you want proved? They said he was not a peepstone gazer, he is. They said he was not a fortune teller, he is. He himself has got a white salamander instead of the angel Moroni, and originally he said it was Nephi. Let me tell you something, if an angel gave me gold plates, I'd know his name. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Whatever happened to what's his name? <laughs> They're gonna have to take that statue down off the top of the Salt Lake Temple and all over the place because it's no longer Moroni blowing the trumpet, it's Alvin. <laughs> and Joseph didn't find the place, Al did. You're not going to get this either. Brigham Young suppressed this. The Mormon Church suppressed it. Like to hear it? This is Mother Smith. This is Joe's mama. You can't believe mama, who can you believe? Listen carefully. I shall change my theme for the present, but let not my readers suppose that because I shall pursue another topic for a season that we have stopped our labor. And when I try and go and win the faculty of Abra under magic circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business, we never during our lives suffered one important interest to swallow up every other obligation. But while we worked with our hands, we endeavored to remember the service and the welfare of our souls. One evening, we were sitting until quite late, conversing upon the subject of the diversity of churches that had risen up in the world, and the many thousands of opinions in existence as to the truths contained in Scripture. Joseph, who never said many words upon any subject, but always seemed to reflect more deeply than common persons of his age upon everything of a religious nature, after we ceased conversing, went on and was pondering in his mind which of the churches was the true one. He saw, uh, and well, excuse me, he went on pondering in bed, and his, he had not laid there long, a bright light entered the room where he lay, and he looked up and saw an angel of the Lord standing by him. The angel spoke. This is the angel. I perceive you are inquiring in your mind which is the true church. There is not a true church on earth. No, not one. Nor has been since Peter took the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood uh, into the uh, kingdom of heaven. The church is in our upon are now upon the earth that are are all man-made churches that's mrs smith giving the record of joseph smith and he didn't get it in the grove he got it in bed brigham young read that and had a hemorrhage and he sent the word out to england where it was published in liverpool get that off the press. And it was gotten off the press. That's why it's difficult to buy a copy of Mother Smith's meditations and history, because Mother knew too much. <laughs> Susan Turley, an editor at the newspaper of the Mormon Sentinel said, quote, like most Mormons I know in the Phoenix area, my testimony of the church is not based on history, isn't that interesting? Not based on history, but on what my own spiritual experiences and study of church doctrine and what it has done for me. Not based on history, not based upon fact. Listen to a Mormon professor, quote, it's an incredible crisis of faith for me. Mormon Klaus Hansen, teacher at Queen's University in Ontario. It means our historical foundation becomes a nice, story that has no connection 
with reality. A nice story. No connection with reality. Now this is just historical material. It would be possible for me to quite literally produce hundreds of pages of materials, documents, affidavits that would convince any sane person that we are dealing with one of the greatest religious frauds of all time. But that's not the reason for rejecting Mormonism. The real reason for rejecting Mormonism is that it has cloaked itself in the garb of Christianity and has maintained that it is the Christian church on the earth. Let's look at the record. Brigham Young says, take up the Bible, check it out. If you are right in every area of theology, and you are wrong about who Jesus Christ is, who God is, you are wrong enough to lose your soul forever. You can be right everywhere, but you better have the right God, and you better have the right Jesus. Jesus Christ said, the ultimate question of the ages is this. What do you think of Christ? Whose son is he? You ask the average Mormon that, they will say, Jesus is the son of God. Don't stop there. Ask the next question. Is Jesus Christ God himself in human flesh? And the answer will be no. Jesus is a God. The Trinity is three gods. The Father is a God, the Son is a God, the Spirit is a God, and each of these gods, with the exception of the Holy Spirit, has a glorified body of flesh and bone. God is a big man. You know that if you're an ex-Mormon. If you are a Mormon, you know I'm telling you the truth. God is a man who lived on another planet, evolved, and came here. And Brigham Young named him. Brigham Young said, He, Adam, is our Father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Hear it, O inhabitants of the earth, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came to the garden, he came with Eve, one of his celestial wives. One of them, Adam was a polygamist before he arrived. Eve was not his first wife, or at least one of his wives. That's Mormon theology. Seven years ago, the Mormon church said, Brigham Young may have taught that. Some of the leaders of the Mormon church might have said that. Listen carefully. But it was never a revelation from the prophet. If it's a revelation from the prophet, it has to be believed. If it's not a revelation, it's just his opinion. Right? Okay. I dug into the archives. <laughs> back to the drawing board. And found this from Brigham. Ready? Quote. How much unbelief exists in the minds of the Latter-day Saints about one doctrine which I revealed to them and which God revealed to me. Is that good enough? Namely, Adam is our father and our God. That is a direct revelation from the prophet to the Mormon church. He said God gave it to him. He said he gave it to the Mormon church. But now the doctrine of Adam and God has fallen into disrepute. It's not good to have Adam as your God in the 20th century. In the 19th century, you get by with it. 20th century, it changes. So now, we no longer have Adam as God. There was a time when Mormons believed, and the Mormon church taught, that Negroes were cursed by God. In fact, their kinky hair thick lips, black skin, and being born in Africa, forbid them the priesthood by divine decree. Because they were the spirits, according to Bruce McConkie and Pearl of Great Price, who would not fight valiantly in heaven against Lucifer. Lucifer wanted to become the savior. 
But the gods, there are lots of them, decided in a vote that he couldn't be savior. And so Jesus was to be the savior. Lucifer got mad, picked up his marbles, and left. And he became Satan, the devil. But you see, some people up there in heaven, on the great star Co-op, fought valiantly against Lucifer, as if God needed help. And then some of the others wouldn't. They became the demons. But there was a group up there who were shiftless and lazy. <laughs> and they just sat by and watched to see who was going to win the battle. And God said, I'm going to get you for that. You are going to earth in the lineage of Cain, the first earthly murderer. And so the Negroes came into existence cursed from the priesthood until every white man should have the priesthood first. And seven years ago, multiracial churches began to spring up in Latin America. Mormon church began to have problems. You say, where'd you get this information? Um, LeGrand Richards was kind enough to put it on tape for us. <laughs> and so Spencer Kimball received some word on the subject after prayer. And the word was, let the blacks have the priesthood. Ollie, Ollie oxen free. The blacks are in. Now you're saying, you're making fun. No, I'm not making fun. This is history. This is Mormon revelation. This allegedly happened on the great star, Kola. So let's look at the Mormon doctrine of God. What really is it? Very simply, this is it. That the head of the gods called the council of the gods and concocted a plan to create the world and people it. Joseph Smith says God himself was once as we are and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. God has body parts and passions and the gods sexually procreate their spirit children. And said God to Joseph, there will be celestial marriage, there will be polygamy on the earth. And God gave Joseph a revelation, Doctrine and Covenants, section 132. Behold, I give you a new and an everlasting covenant, and if you do not abide in it, you will be damned. Nobody could misunderstand that. What was it? Mormon Church practiced it from 1838 until 1890. It was known as polygamy. However, the government of the United States, a little slow in those days as now, <laughs> took an extremely dim view of this and informed the Mormon Church that they would be removed from the United States of America into Mexico and all of their holdings in Utah would be confiscated. At that juncture, guess what happened? A word came from heaven. Guess what it was? Give up polygamy. So the God who said, I give you a new and an everlasting covenant, in 1890 said, it's a short everlasting. It's over. <laughs> now you have eternal polygamy. You get married in the temple, you get sealed, married to many women, and in the resurrection you summon these women forth from the grave to be your wives. And you will sexually procreate children with them for all eternity. What a future you girls have got to look forward to, eternal baby makers. <laughs> if this is Christianity, it is the strangest breed of Christianity that ever existed on the face of the earth. It is not the restored gospel. And I'll tell you why. Because God doesn't discriminate against people on the basis of their skin. He sent Jesus Christ to save you, whatever the color of your skin. In Jesus Christ, there is neither barbarian, sixteen, slave, nor free, male nor female, one body in Christ. 
and the whole damnable revelation that cursed the Negroes originated in the mind of a racist. And the Mormon church until seven years ago was the largest pornographic racist Ku Klux Klan in the United States until they changed it. And nobody can deny that because it's on record. That is not Christianity. Christianity doesn't curse men for so-called pre-existent lives and send them into the world with black skin and thick lips and kinky hair and in the lineage of Cain. That's not the gospel. Never was. Now the God of the Bible is not a big man. The reason why he's not a big man is because he says so. God is not a man. Clear enough? Jesus discoursed on the nature of his father. If you can't believe Jesus, you can't believe anybody. Jesus said, God is spirit. There is no article in the Greek. God is not a spirit, as the King James says. The Greek says, God is spirit. And Jesus said, spirit does not have flesh and bone. So God is not a big man, and the Father does not have a body of flesh and bone as tangible as man's, because Jesus said so. I was talking to some Mormon scholars one time, and they said, we believe in the divinity of Christ. And I said, I don't doubt that. But you don't believe in the deity of Christ. There's no Mormon in this room tonight that can open the King James Bible and read the first chapter of the Gospel of John and say amen to it in good conscience. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Not a God, not one God among many gods, one God. A Mormon professor one time debated me in a large church in San Jose, California. And we got into a discussion. I was answering questions. He was asking them. I was asking. He was answering. And finally, I said to him, Professor, let's put this on a simple level so anybody here with a sixth grade education can understand it. He said, Fairman. I said, if God personally told you, you will never become a God. Nobody will ever become a God. Would you believe him? He looked at me rather strangely. I said, it's not a trap. It's just a question. If he personally told you, would you believe him and not the Mormon church? He said, if God personally told me, I believe. I said, and you leave the Mormon church? Yes. I said, good. Would you read for me one verse from the Old Testament? Isaiah 43, verse 10. And he read it. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know that you may believe, that you may understand. Before me there was no God formed, and neither shall there be after me. I looked right at him and I said, you are not going to make it, Doc. Because God personally told you. Now the Bible mentions gods and goddesses. The Bible says that there are those that are called gods and lords in heaven and earth. And you can make a god out of anything that you want to. You can make it out of money, power, status, position, sex, family, nation, patriotism, whatever you want. For whatever you worship becomes for you your God. But it does not become God, the Creator, the one true and living God. Never. Amen. 
In Galatians 4, 8, where I began, the Apostle Paul says to the Galatians, you did service in your past life to them who by nature are no gods. By nature are no gods. So there's one God by nature. What is his nature? He is eternal. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is pure spirit. He is everywhere, and he sent his Son into the world to save us from our sins. That is the God of the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ was asked this question in Mark chapter 12. Look at it in your Bible. Master, what is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, is one. First commandment of the law. There is only one God. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God, one intercessor between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. You can call anything gods and anything lords and goddesses that you want, but there is one God from everlasting to everlasting, and the Mormons do not have an eternal God. The Mormon gods are evolving, and men hope to become gods, to evolve their own harems, their own planets, their own worlds. This is not Christianity. Now, Jesus Christ is the eternal God in human flesh. Mormonism categorically denies this. And it teaches instead that Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Lucifer who became the devil. That the Jesus of the Mormons is a polygamist, is a record of history. That he had children is also Mormon teaching. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. Isaiah 53, prophesying Jesus Christ's coming into the world, said that he would be cut off from the land of the living and that no one could declare his seed. No children. The only children Jesus ever had are you and me. For when we make his life an offering for sin, he sees his children. We are his children. Mormon church says God has a body of flesh and bone as tangible as man's. Indeed. On one of my tapes, I recount the story of how a group of Mormon missionaries encountered me in upper New York State, and they were arguing vigorously for the nature of God. One of them stood up and said, if I can prove to you out of the Bible, not out of our sacred books, but out of the Bible, that Jesus Christ is not truly God, and if I can prove to you out of the Bible that God has a body of flesh and bone as tangible as man, would you accept it? I said, certainly. He said, first, God has a body of flesh and bones. And he started quoting. Underneath us are the everlasting arms. God has arms. The hand of the Lord wrote on the wall. God has a hand. The finger of the Lord cast out demons. God has a finger. Your feasts are a stink in my nostril. God has a nose. The word has gone out of his mouth. God has a mouth. His feet are planted in the footsteps of the sea. God has feet. His head and his hair are as white as wool. God has a head and hair. And he went on and on and on ad infinitum ad nauseum, quoting verses from the scripture. Five minutes down the pike, he finished. And he said, there you are, sir. From your own Bible, God is an exalted man. You should memorize this verse if you don't know it. I said, turn to Psalm 91, verse 4, and read that one, too. And he did. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. <laughs> now he's a chicken. <laughs> I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now he's a loaf of bread. I am the door. Now he's wooden hinges. I said, do you really believe that? He said, no, sir. I said, what kind of language is that? He said, figurative language. I said, you know that because you're an educated young man, but Joseph and Brigham didn't have a sixth grade education. They couldn't have known this. That's why they thought God was an exalted man, but he isn't an exalted man. God is spirit, and you must worship him in spirit and in truth. You are not going to make it to divinity. Joseph did not tell you the truth. Christ told you the truth. You must be born from above. 
If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away. All things have become new, and all things are from God, who reconciled us to himself by the death of his son. Now, often people say to me, you go out and give lectures on this subject all the time in different parts of the country. Don't the Mormons ever respond? Now let me tell you something that's never been made public before. When I appeared on the Christian Broadcasting Network with Pat Robertson and made comments on Mormonism, as did others, Ed Decker, I believe, appeared also. The Mormons were terribly upset by this and claimed that they were misrepresented and quoted out of context. The only thing we could do was to say, all right, let's give them equal time. A Mormon senator wrote Pat Robertson, I have a copy of the letter, in which he suggested that a designated representative of the Mormon church meet with myself and Ed Decker on national television on CBN. If Pat Robertson would give the time, Pat Robertson agreed in writing to give two hours of time to the Mormon church and myself and Ed Decker to appear and to discuss Mormonism for the whole world to see. And they have never been back in two years. And they won't be. Because the one thing that the public must never find out must never find out is that Jesus Christ came into existence by sexual relations between a big man and the Virgin Mary. What the public will not put up with is Mormon doctrine unvarnished. They will put up with Marie Osmond and Donnie and the Osmond family. They will put up with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. They will put up with Grandfather Lee Spencer Kimball. They will put up with the clean-shaven Mormon missionary, but they will not put up with the bastardization of Jesus Christ. Brigham Young says, hear it forever. Here's the record. Listen to the prophet. Jesus Christ was not conceived by the Holy Ghost. Well, I think the writer of the Gospel of Matthew is in a better condition and position to speak on the subject than Brigham. Listen to it. The birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. Matthew 1.18. His mother Mary was engaged to Joseph before they had sexual relations. Check your Greek text. They're professors at Brigham Young University. They can read Greek. Let them check it. It says before he had sexual relations with her, she was found pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Brigham, why? You say, can't you put it any more tactful way than that? <laughs> Listen, are we children? Have we lost our reason? that you cannot read plain English and understand it? If a man says he's a prophet of God and he lies, he's not a prophet of God. That's as simple as that. <laughs> On the John Ankerberg television show, Mormon representatives, the state president and the bishop appeared. They refused to answer questions on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. I don't blame them. If I had that kind of pornography for my doctrine, I wouldn't want to answer any questions on it either. Now let's understand each other. Not me as a Baptist minister, or you as Mormons, or whatever else you may be. Let's understand each other as human beings. Before we are Baptists or Mormons or any other denomination, we are living human beings with souls, and we are going to answer to God someday for those souls. Do we agree on that? Spencer Kimball will not be there, Gordon Hinckley will not be there, Joseph Smith won't be there, Brigham Young won't be there. You are going to be there with Jesus Christ, and so am I, and we will personally give an account to him. Now, since that's true, I think it would be a very good idea to find out before you get there whether or not you are believing what Jesus Christ said. Never mind what people said. In fact, I'll go one step further for you that will delight some Mormons who are here. If you don't want to believe what I say, you think I'm not telling you the truth, if you will promise faithfully on your honor to forsake the Mormon religion and turn to Jesus Christ and be born again, you know what I will do? 
I will personally give you the documents that show you this chapter and verse. That's a fair offer. If I'm wrong, the documents in your own archives are wrong. If I'm wrong, the literature of the church is wrong. I'm telling you the truth. I lie not before God. The God of Mormonism is not the God of the Bible, and the Savior of Mormonism is not Jesus of Nazareth. It is another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. There are false apostles and deceitful workmen who transform themselves to look like the apostles of Christ. And if you will believe them and you will not test them, the Book of Mormon says you'll go to hell. I didn't say it. The Mormon said it. The Book of Mormon said there's only one God. Look at the front of it. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one God, which are one God. Mormon Church today says, well, actually it says there's one God, but what it means is one in purpose and will. Where does it say that in the Book of Mormon? In the marvelous work in a wonder, LeGrand Richard says, the Book of Mormon is a very unique book. It has a familiar spirit. <laughs> Do you notice that? It says that. It has a familiar spirit. Now go and look up what a familiar spirit is, okay? Leviticus chapter 19. Regard not those that have familiar spirits. <laughs> Pay no attention to them. Because it's of the devil. Mormon God is a big man. The Mormon Jesus is another Jesus. The Mormon doctrine of salvation is plan A and plan B, like a Chinese restaurant menu. Plan A is you're resurrected, that's salvation. Plan B, you go to exaltation. Repentance, baptism, faith, and good works replace the gospel. What is the gospel? By grace you have been saved through faith, and not by yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is by grace alone through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every single thing that I have said tonight is based on the New Testament record and the teachings of the God of the Bible. He tells us in Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. I am God. There is no one else. What I say is not an attack upon the Mormon people. It is an attack upon a system which has enslaved them through Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And a prophet who wrote to his own people that he had done a greater work than Jesus Christ. And then turned to his own people and said, and if you don't like it, you must lump it. Now when I made that quotation a while back, I had some Mormons talk to me afterwards, and they said, Joseph didn't really say that, did he? And I said, well, why don't you just listen to Joseph? You don't have to take my word for it at all, because Joseph is on record, and Joseph's words are final in this subject. Listen to Joseph. God is in the still small voice, and all these affidavits and indictments, it's all of the devil. I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. History of the Church, Bible 6, page 408, 409. Quote, God made Aaron to be a mouthpiece for the children of Israel. He will make me be... God to you in his place, the elders to be mouth for me, and if you don't like it, you must lump it, close quote. History of the Church, volume 6, 319 and 320. I don't like it, I won't lump it, and I will preach against it. <laughs> Time is always our mortal enemy. And so, as we draw to a close in this area, I could go on quoting passage after passage, doctrine after doctrine. The doctrine of Mrs. God. 
Jesus and Satan are brothers. The marriage of Christ. And all other churches are false. Only the Mormon religion is true. An apostasy has come, they tell us, which wiped out Christianity and it didn't come back to the earth until Joe arrived. How sad. Matthew 16, 18. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Well, let me tell you something. The church disappeared from the earth for 1,800 years. The gates of hell prevailed against it. But he never left himself without a witness. And the miracle of Christianity is this. When you compare it with the faith of the Latter-day Saints, it is the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. It is the gospel that transforms the lives of men. It is the gospel that does not discriminate because of the color of the skin. It is a gospel that has a priesthood, the priesthood of all believers. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, summoned out of darkness to live in God's marvelous light. In Revelation chapter 1 it says we are a kingdom of priests to serve God, his Father, unto him that loved us and has loosed us from our sins in his own blood, Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ of the Bible is our great high priest who has passed through the heavens. He is our intercessor before the throne of God. There is no Melchizedek priesthood nor Aaronic priesthood. They were inventions of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. And they are refuted in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 12 and 24. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12, the priesthood of Aaron was changed at the cross. And in Hebrews 7, 24, the Melchizedek priesthood is inviolate. It belongs to Jesus Christ alone. I will offer you the greatest thing in the world tonight, freedom, the gospel of grace. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in thine heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But you must confess that he's Lord. He is the Lord God in human flesh. There is only one God, and God has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. Whether you're a Mormon or a non-Mormon or a Christian, you will inevitably acknowledge this because the scripture says so. Unto me every knee will bend and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church.